Check Podcasts. Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, your source for all the latest in BC politics. I'm your host, Rob Shaw, coming to you as always from the Czech News World Media Headquarters here in Victoria. A big week in BC politics. We are talking the government's recent forestry announcements, an important new deal on natural resource development, and a new special advisor for the Premier on healthcare. Make sure you subscribe for audio extras in our podcast version of the show as well. To break it all down, we are joined, as always, with the pod squad. Jillian Oliver, Jeff Ferrier, and Ali Blades are here. Thank you for being here and walking us through all of this. We are going to start with forestry. It's not a topic we discuss a lot in BC politics, actually, even though it employs tens of thousands of people and hundreds of millions in revenue through logging and mills. Mostly it comes up when the NDP government is talking about things like protecting old growth logging or reducing raw log exports or partnering with Indigenous communities and reconciliation. But this week, the Premier made several announcements, a manufacturing fund, a fibre supply fund, retooling mills. There was the Canfor mill closure on the pulp line in Prince George uh, that cost 300 people their jobs, putting that all together. Jeff, let's start with you. How, how did the Premier do on forestry this week and, and what kind of issue is it for the government, do you think? Forestry is a bedrock of BC's economy. It is a huge source of employment and uh, revenue for um, the the province and for communities and uh, uh, working class people across the province and huge spinoffs in communities. So it's absolutely important. Uh, uh, It is a cyclical industry. We're seeing a downturn in that industry as prices uh, for for fiber uh, are weakening from the highs that we saw during COVID and uh, 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 you're seeing the impacts filter out through uh, the industry and communities right now. Uh, I think that the government absolutely does care about forestry. I've heard suggestions from some that they do not. That was me. Everyone in the legislature, everyone in the legislature cares uh, an awful lot about this industry and the people who work in it. And I think what you saw from the government this week uh, I think close to $160 million of provincial investment into forestry, forestry community, forestry workers to protect those jobs and to help people uh, who are affected by downturns in the economy. And uh, this against the backdrop of a government that is working to to, to modernize the industry, put it more of a focus on value added, uh, like mass timber uh, and more manufacturing and mill work in the province uh, as they look forward to the future. So uh, it, it's a, absolutely a tough week. I think the Premier was right to focus primarily on listening to folks in Prince George and showing some empathy and taking some action. And I think he did uh, all of those things. And it's going to continue to be tough. Yeah, the, I mean, the biggest one, um, one of the biggest announcements, I think, was the $50 million fund to help uh, mills uh, get access to the kind of dead wood uh, and slash piles and burnt wood that they need to keep operating. I think uh, it was something the industry had been calling for, uh, and perhaps in a different universe, uh, had it been announced uh, months ago or weeks ago, it might have prevented uh, some of the layoffs that we're seeing in the sector now. I don't know. It, was, it seemed to be more of a kind of give the premier something to announce uh, during the week uh, type of announcement. Uh, Jillian, does this form a cohesive kind of forest strategy? Did you come away this week with any thoughts on where either where the government's going or what it's trying to do or or what it what its thoughts are on this sector um well you know i think that it is um really a continuation of of the um the ndp government under horgan they've been talking about value added um switching to value added um industry for you know for a long time um this kind of puts a little bit more money behind it but it's not a whole lot when you add it up. Um, the the transition fund is ninety million over three years. Um, it, you know it's expensive to 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 retool these uh, mills. Um, all three parties have been talking about this kind of transition being needed for a long time, but it's just one of those things that's much easier said than done. Um, and you know I think um, we're we're starting to see all three parties. Um, 
speak a little bit more truthfully about the the reality of the forest. EB said last week that they're exhausted. Um, we've seen some liberal MLAs like Mike Morris talk about the reality of the forest ecosystems, and the reality is is that you know they these are ecosystems that have been managed to the brink, and there's a lot um, of different uh, pressures on the forest. The NDP, you know, old growth was a huge wedge issue in their leadership campaign. Um, there's a lot of NDP MLAs that, you know, really, um, this is a really important issue for them and their constituents, and they want to see um, the old growth protection strategy accelerated. EB has promised that, but we've yet to see the details. So I think this is going to continue to be one of the hardest issues for the government to manage um, because it's just... For so long, I think governments have tried to sort of have it both ways. Um, and, it, you know, they're running up against the, the reality that there's just not the the fiber there that there used to be. Mm -hmm. Allie, let's bring you in. What do you what do you think of this? So we heard the premier talk a lot about this because, of course, he was at the BC Natural Resource Forum, which is the hub for an annual conversation about all of our natural resources, forestry, energy, mining. Uh, so, you know, kudos to him for entering a space that's not really his natural audience as well. But, you know, you mentioned this uh, at the onset, Rob, you know, forestry is the province's largest uh, largest export industry. It in, It's uh, tens of thousands of jobs, and it's also some of the highest wages in the province too. Uh, but I'll, I'll disagree with Jeff in his comment that the NDP care about this industry. It's if they cared about the industry, then wouldn't they have not canceled the cabinet working group on forestry? Uh, and then even though there's millions of dollars of investment going into this and it's debatable whether or not uh, just throwing money at the problem where uh, we are with the manufacturing fund, it's not really helping those 300 families that were affected by the uh, partial closures at uh, the at Canfor. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention this one quote from Jock Finlayson and Ken Peacock from BCBC, and I think it reigns true to the foundation of the issue, which is the fact that uh, we're signaling to the world that that we're not a space for forestry investment as well. And so they've said. In both logging and wood product manufacturing, BC has the highest operating cost and the least attractive investment climate in North America. So no wonder leading equity analysts describe our province as essentially uninvestable across most segments of our forest products uh, here in BC. So in summary, lots of money, but uh, at the foundation of it all, we're, we're telling the world that this is not a place to invest. It's a chicken and sort of egg argument sometimes from, from government because you hear the government and groups say, we need, to, we need to extract more value from what remains in British Columbia's forests, so we need to retool our mills and our production lines to be innovative. And then the companies say, well, we're not going to spend money to re-innovate if we don't have security from government on getting access to the trees, getting access to the fiber. We don't know what the plan is for forestry. We're caught up in the middle of reconciliation discussions, the, the outcomes of which aren't known. Uh, and then so you sort of stuck like who's going to make the first step to innovate and how are they going to do that and how does it work? And you find yourself in a, in a discussion like this week. I, um, I spent the week trying really hard to understand the direction of forestry in, in the province. I think I have sort of landed on the fact that I think forestry is what falls in between the NDP's plans for old growth, uh, climate change, reconciliation uh, and protecting the land. And then forestry is just the other stuff, I don't get the sense there's a clear kind of uh, vision for it other than value added. How many years have we been listening to value added from premiers uh, at, at speeches like this? It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, Jeff, I'm, I know you're itching. I know you're itching. Yeah. Scratch the I'm itch itching. and jump you in. You can see it. You can see it in my face. I'm <laughs> itching to, to fire back. I, I would say that it's, well, it's, it's silly to say that any party in the legislature doesn't care about forestry. Uh, and I'll just leave that uh, right there. I will say that in terms of the vision, uh, you know, and, and I, I respect uh, BC, BC a lot, but that's the same kind of rhetoric you always hear from uh, a big corporate interests when they are looking to lower their costs to boost their profits. And Canfor's, I think it, it had a profit of $1.5 billion. And uh, uh, this, they made the decision 
uh, that they may not to invest in BC. And maybe that's a, a function of uh, the fact that, and this is me freewheeling here, I'm not speaking for anyone, but uh, maybe the model of big uh, 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 international investors, uh, shareholders in Toronto controlling our forests and not communities and indigenous nations controlling our forests and in charge of forestry and running mills and taking a longer term view on you know, the value of investment and the importance of sustainability and the importance of local jobs and manufacturing. Maybe that's the direction that government should look to, to make sure that forestry remains a viable and sustainable concern, instead of always worrying about, will the shareholders in Toronto get all of the, the money they want to boost their, uh, uh, so they can uh, boost their investment funds. Right. And I, you know, I, I think that's where behind the scenes, the conversations are, uh, are happening. Yeah, well, it, it's a, it's certainly one of the things the government keeps saying, and, and to expand it to our next topic in the natural resource sector, those partnerships between indigenous nations and, and local businesses seems to be where the government wants to go in the larger natural resources discussion. It has a landmark deal with the Blueberry River First Nation and the other Treaty 8 nations this week that settles a case government lost a few years ago that all of the oil and gas and forestry and hunting and mining and fishing on these lands, the cumulative effect had violated the treaty rights uh, of the Blueberry River Nation. And so the premier announced a new deal, a new kind of path forward, a partnership on how to make these decisions. And Jeff, you talked a bit about the idea behind it. Uh, Jillian, what does it mean, I think, for the rest? Like, it's a long ways away. It's northeastern British Columbia. If you're watching this show or you're listening to it in the metro Vancouver or Victoria, it's so far away, you, you know, you've probably never been there. But what is the impact of a, a fundamental kind of change and a shift in this sector uh, going forward, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting agreement. Um, it was in response to a, a, a court decision um, that found that 84% of the, the nation's territory was within 500 meters of an industrial disturbance. So just such widespread disturbance that the court, you know, ruled that this was, you know, a, a, such an encroachment on their treaty rights. Um, and so what we have now is a is a revenue sharing and joint decision making partnership that really, you know, should have been the way that we have been um, working with First Nations in terms of resource extraction, you know, forever, if we if we're looking at, you know, true equal partnership. Um, and it's going to be, you know, really, the province is also putting up some money for, you um, for land restoration as well to sort of try to, um, you know, undo some of the things that have already been done. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how this moves forward, um, what it means for the continued uh, industrial activity um, and and how different it is in terms of the benefits for the local communities there. Um, and we also saw uh, the government uh, apply this agreement to the other Treaty 8 First Nations. Um, it's moving forward with its implementation of UNDRIP. It's going to be interesting to see if presumably this is sort of the new standard um, that the, the province sets for those relationships because it is really transformative. Mm -hmm. Ali, does it mean less natural resource extraction? I mean, part of these deals are a reduction in the timber harvesting, a reduction in the oil and gas exploration. And, and then the sector is looking for certainty from government. So is the certainty that there is less uh, of these things allowed or is the certainty that there could be more if there's the right partnerships or how do you sort of interpret what it means for the future of, of natural resource development especially in the in the northeast i think it actually clears up a bit of that uncertainty so these are um, goalposts that everybody can understand and that uh, the community is also very much a part of and that's something that potentially has uh, delayed a lot of projects. And so this is also an area that, where we have to recognize that the majority of wealth generated in this province does come from outside of the lower mainland. And this is an area that is rich in natural resources. Uh, so there's a lot of attention in this particular area of our country as well. And so for everyone involved, there is now a bit of a plan. It's uncertain because we haven't necessarily seen it all yet. It's still to be released what those goalposts will be, but it is better than what it was before, which was a whole lot of discussion, nothing moving really forward. Uh, so 
I'd say overall, I mean, this is what reconciliation is supposed to look like with uh, communities at the table. And that's certainly what we saw from uh, remarks from Blueberry First Nations as well. Mm -hmm. Jeff? I think uh, 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 Jillian and Allie both make some really good points. I'm going to be a, a little prickly with uh, governments on this. It would sure be nice to get an announcement about uh, uh, reconciliation moving forward in this way without there having to be a reference of nations going to the courts and winning the rights, right? This is the, not the result of an altruistic government. And that's, this has been the case for governments of all stripes. It remains a, you know, a fight and a struggle. I'm glad we are where we are at uh, today. I think Ali's right that it provides some certainty around uh, in, you know, how you get to invest. And I, and I would say to folks who uh, think that indigenous nations are reflexively opposed to resource development, that, that is completely not the case, that the issue for them is uh, control and uh, ability to influence decisions on what happens in their territories and making sure that it done, is done right and that they and their communities benefit from what happens. And that's not true in every single uh, nation, and there are different nations have different viewpoints, but there is a strong desire among nations to advance the interests of their nations um, by supporting development. And, and this may make someone's head uh, explode, but I was on the Twitter machine last night and saw, of all people, Pierre Polievre making that point exactly uh, about you know, reconciliation is about folks in government and folks uh, in downtown Vancouver telling nations what's best for them. And the best thing that we can do is have mature relationships with nations that provide certainty and clarity around when development can happen and gives them a central role in those decisions as they happen. So I'm glad it's there. Uh, there's a lot more to do, though. Yeah, you heard it here first. Jeff, Agrees with Pierre Polyev Agreed. on natural resource development and reconciliation. <laughs> take that to the bank. No context, BC. Just take that. In that, in that, one, in that, in that one clip. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's move on to another uh, interesting topic here. As the Premier announcing he'd hired Penny Ballam as his new special advisor on health care. I think the technical title is the Premier's Health System Specialist. You probably recognize Ballam. Uh, she helped create BC's COVID vaccine rollout. The, probably one of the biggest projects government's ever undertaken and largely a success. You know, you're able to get register and get your vaccine. Um, she's also a former deputy minister of health and city of Vancouver manager and a doctor. And a, I think she's still the chair of Vancouver Coastal Health. So very credentialed, a lot of expertise. The question I think where a lot of us have is there is a minister of health. Um, what, what does the premier get out of having a special advisor on health? And uh, this is also the second special advisor Doug White is the Indigenous Relations Special Advisor. So, Ali, what, what do you think of this? So there's a few points I want to make on this. Um, I actually quite appreciate the fact that we now have a doctor also advising in this very critical uh, portfolio in that, like, our health care spending is, if I'm not mistaken, about 40% of our budget. Uh, so quite substantial. Uh, and there's a lot that we learned over the pandemic that we need to get uh, go into as we move forward on decisions to be made. So, you know, with all the respect to uh, Minister Dix, I'd rather get my uh, medical advice from a trained doctor with a lot of uh, expertise than him. And um, so uh, ultimately, I don't think that the special advisor is a bad idea. Uh, I will note that in everything that I've been able to read about uh, Penny Ballum, she also doesn't come with a cheap price tag either. Uh, so this is going to be interesting in um, how long she sticks around and how much the bill is for her expertise as well. Mm -hmm. Julian? Yeah, it is really interesting. Um, I think it's, you know, we're starting to see the the key differences in how EV's running his government um, compared to the previous uh, Horgan administration. I think, you know, Horgan had a, a far less centralized approach where he gave his ministers, um, you know, a, lo a lot of leash to sort of um, work on their initiatives and, and sort of bring them back. Um, sometimes uh, that was effective. Other times, you know, we saw that 
play out in terms of house mismanagement or in terms of sort of a lack of, um, you know, a lack of impactful progress because there wasn't that sort of central uh, power really driving things forward, um, you know, in a really strong way. Um, Whereas now we're seeing EV sort of concentrate a lot more of the decision making and a lot of more of the sort of big strategy pieces um, within the PO. Um, like you mentioned, there's there's special advisors on other issues as well. Um, but, you know, I think it's too soon to see exactly how this is going to play out. But I think it raises a lot of interesting questions like what happens if one of his advisors has a disagreement with either, you know, a minister or a deputy minister? Um, how do these advisors interface with the civil service? Um, are they just providing policy advice to the premier so that he can sort of, you know, look at things from a, have an outsider's perspective and, and sort of think about different ways that he could um, make changes? Uh, with the way that government is, is doing things. I think um, it also signals, you know, that there's a recognition within the premier's office that the way that things are being done aren't working. And when it comes to healthcare, I think that's a really good thing. We've got, you know, many crises in that file. Um, and it's clear that something has got to change. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see in the long term um, if EB can continue to manage, you know, a really large caucus, very complex stakeholder relationships throughout uh, the province, like the, the Horgan administration did so ably, um, uh, while still kind of pushing through the the bigger sorts of changes, it seems like he's trending towards. Yeah, Jeff, really quickly, and then we'll carry this conversation to the podcast. What do you think of this? Uh, you know what cabinet ministers love? When someone from the premier's office comes into their office and says, hey, I'm with the premier and I'm here to help. Uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, I think at the end of the day where British Columbians will judge this appointment and all special advisor appointments will be on the results that the government achieves before the next election. Is she going to, is Dr. Ballum going to help make progress? Is she going to deliver results? Is she going to bring a different point of view that, 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 that gets folks to where we want to be? And uh, the decision will be made not on, you know, what she was paid or, um, uh, how she interfaces with a cabinet, it'll be on uh, British Columbians and can they see a family doctor, are ER weights shorter, and uh, do they feel a net benefit to all the government has done since EB's become premier? And yeah. that's where the rubber will hit the road. Okay, we'll continue this on. If you're watching us on YouTube or check, make sure you subscribe to the podcast for an extended discussion. But thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next week with all the latest in BC politics here on Political Capital.